Hello and welcome to the Thriving Abroad podcast. I'm Louise Wiles, an expat and transition coach and your host for these conversations where we share stories, strategies, tips and a few tricks to help you build a thriving international life. And welcome to this conversation where I talk to Louise Ross about her latest book, The Winding Road to Portugal. Now Louise's name may be familiar to some of you because I first interviewed her in episode 46, just after she had had her first book published in Portugal, called Women Who Walk, How 20 Women from 16 Countries Came to Live in Portugal. It's actually one of the most listened to and viewed, there is a video version, episodes in the Thriving Abroad podcast series. So if you haven't already listened, I highly recommend it. Now in today's conversation, We talk about how Louise decided that she really had to balance out the stories from a gender perspective and share the stories of 20 men from 11 countries who all came to be living in Portugal. Now Louise drew this observation about vulnerability from the stories. So then, um, you know, accepted ideas of masculinity exclude emotional vulnerability. And, uh, and yet this is a really profound disservice to, to boys and men because, you know, vulnerability is essential to our capacity to build intimacy and sustain uh, loving and healthy relationships. And um, so in that regard, the, you know, the complexity and, and paradox of what it means to be a man today, emotionally vulnerable and heart-connected yet strong and in control, um, creates this... Um, this disparate way of being in the world that was really apparent in their stories. So to hear more about the men she interviewed, their amazing stories and her insights, then listen to this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. And just before you do, as always, you can access the transcript from thrivingbroad.com, look for episode 68 and the blog associated with that episode there you'll find the transcript. And while you're there, remember to sign up for the regular Thriving World podcast newsletter. That way I can stay in touch and keep you up to date. Thanks for listening today. And do get in touch if there is any way in which I can support you in your international journey. Contact details are available on the Thriving Board website. Enjoy this conversation. So hello, I'm really lovely to welcome you, Louise, to today's conversation, the conversation with the two Louises, <laughs> Louise Ross sitting in um, Cascais, well, not quite Cascais, but near Cascais in Portugal and me here in the UK. Lovely to have you joining the Thriving Board conversation today, Louise. Thank you, Louise. Lovely to be here again. Yes, yes, it is. And it's really lovely to be celebrating the publication of your second book. So the second Indeed. book yes, is, um, yeah, The Winding Road to Portugal, um, which is the sequel to the first book, Women Who Walk. So I will ask you to explain more about those in a moment. But to everyone listening, I will put links in the, on the blog post back to the episode where Louise talks about the first book. Um, but I will allow Louise to elaborate a bit more on, about that. So how about you just start by telling us a little bit about you um, and your sort of international experience to date and then a bit about the background to the books. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, my international experience to date, let's see. So I'm originally from Australia and I've lived abroad about 35 years now. Um in uh, my early 20s, I went to the US, travelled around uh, on route to London where I worked and then uh, France where I also worked for a period of time and then eventually went back to the US to complete um, graduate studies in uh, psychology and counselling and then I lived there for many years and about... Well, it was actually it was in 2011, I think. I met a Portuguese woman in Mexico and we became great pals and she'd come and visit me and I'd come and visit her here and here in Portugal and her family and extended family were incredibly 
welcoming, kind, and and um, they introduced me to Portugal, the the food, the culture, the language, and uh, and I was just um, enamoured by um, uh, life here, and it, it sort of reminded me of coastal life in uh, Sydney and, and Melbourne, partic particularly along the, the, the coast outside of Lisbon, which is where I live now. And so in 2014, I packed up and I moved. I sold up my life in the US and, and moved here. And, and now I live um, a couple of villages toward Lisbon um, from the Cascais end of the, of, the, of the train line in a village called Saint Joel. <laughs> Yeah. So I should just explain to people listening. So the 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 sort of train line comes out of Lisbon to Cascais. It finishes in Cascais, but it's quite a well known train ride. Um, so if you're ever visiting Lisbon, that's one thing to look at, isn't it? The the train ride from Cais de Sorge to Cascais takes you along right. the coast and through yeah. all these villages. One of which is where you yeah you are living. Yeah. 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 It's kind of a uh, urban sprawl these days because yeah. the little original villages are surrounded by urban sprawl, basically. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, so you can, yeah, be excused for thinking it's just all Lisbon, but it's not. <laughs> um, each, each, that's the interesting thing because each little place that you stop at has its own heart and centre, and, yeah. and yeah. some really little, pr pretty little villages. And, well. They really are. Villages, towns, I'm not sure what they are yeah. now, but yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, they would have been villages once upon a time yeah. now that yeah. they're towns. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but really lovely centres often, really worth a wander around if you have time mm -hmm. to spare. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So your life brought you to, to Cascais and to, to mm -hmm. Portugal. And you, a few years ago, had the inspiration for writing your first book, which mm -hmm. was then followed by the second. So tell, you, tell us a little bit about what led you to want to write these books and then a bit about what you know, these books are, are about. Yes. Um, well, as soon as I arrived here, I quickly got involved in an organisation called International Women in Portugal. And uh, I was really uh, impressed by the calibre of um, uh, personal stories I was hearing from the women that, that I was meeting in the international community and I decided that since nobody else had recorded these stories that, that I would do it. I thought that for posterity that these stories would make a great collection and a collection of stories that could perhaps um, be part of the historical archives here of the internationals that have come and gone from this you know incredible country so I set out to gather these stories from women that I was meeting uh, through a hiking group that I participated in and then uh, women that I was just generally meeting in the international community some had been were long-termers <laughs> as we call them perhaps they'd lived here for you know 20 30 years and others were I suppose newer to Portugal um, and so this became the first book, Women Who Walk, which uh, I released, uh, I guess, December of 2018, and then it really took off last year from, from January onwards. And uh, at presentations to various groups, book groups and international women's groups, both here in Portugal and then within Europe, because I began to reach out to other international women's groups around Europe to see if they would be interested in in hearing me present about the stories in this book, which they were because there's something universal about the, the stories that the women share. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, well, there's you know an international expatriate community and um, the, the stories have this sort of universal nature. And so, yes, I was doing these presentations here in Portugal and, and around Europe. But anyway, at these presentations, of course, one of the questions that, that, that people would ask, uh, will, will you do a similar book about men? And uh, my response was, well, I've just released this. I'm not sort of thinking about the, the next <laughs> book. But, but nevertheless, that is what happened. And um, I can tell you how that happened or how that, that evolved, if you're interested. Yeah, go on, tell us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
it was probably, I mean, I released the, I released the women's book in January and then it was in February, I think, that I was in Lisbon and I caught an Uber home. And the, uh, my Uber driver uh, was quite chatty and I asked him a few questions and he began to share his story. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, asked additional questions. And the twists and turns that uh, his life had taken was so riveting that I knew I wanted to interview him, do some kind of formal interview with him. And so he uh, agreed to that. And from that point, I, I realised that I'd, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and do uh, another book, that collecting another 20 stories for a book about how men found their way to, to Portugal would be um, uh, a nice uh, uh, complement to, mm -hmm. to the women's book. And what I also realised after I talked to Ramon, the Uber driver, is that um, I wanted to talk to men who had made unconventional life choices and who were somehow setting an example by living their life differently or on their own terms and men whose voices that we're not accustomed to hearing. Um, and the 20 men that I ultimately interviewed, and I say ultimately because there are about 10 men who didn't want to participate, and, and that's an interesting sort of sidebar story um, but the, the the men that I did interview were business creatives come entrepreneurs they were self-starters some of who'd pull, who'd pull themselves up by the bootstraps um, they were not necessarily men who were um, like embassy men who'd moved you know country to country through the diplomatic corps um, these to me are kind of just regular guys, which um, makes their stories even more interesting. Yeah, yeah. And we'll definitely get on and talk about you know, what you pulled out from those stories for the themes that you, um, you, you, you sort of recognise running through many of the stories. But just, just to give people an idea, so they're not sort of the more conventional um, sort of images of, of men moving abroad, abroad as you've just described. So who were they? Can you sort of describe the demographic in terms of is mm. there an age range? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, of course, again, when I set out to find the guys, it wasn't as easy as, as finding the women because I was, uh, you know, participating in so many events and activities that involved the international community mm. and that it was easy to meet the women. But the, the men, it was... It was a little bit, I suppose, haphazard. You know, I'd perhaps meet someone or someone would tell me about a guy that they had met and I'd hear a, a compelling story. Or in other words, I'd developed an ear for a really good story after interviewing mm -hmm. the women. So my hunch was, oh, I want to talk to that person. I, I want to hear a little bit more about them. So... Then, as a result of that, the age range of the men is is greater. So it's from 25 to 90. In fact, the oldest oh, wow. participant just turned 90, which I love. You know, so this um, huge age range. But versus the women, so the average age for the women was, I think, early 50s. Um, the age because of the greater age range with the men the average age I think is sort of mid 40s something like that mm -hmm. um so I um didn't necessarily put out word that I was looking for men of a particular age or a particular demographic or um it, it was just very organic very right. organic yeah mm -hmm. Mm. And um, so let's see, most of them are partnered. Uh, one's a widower. Uh, three of the men are gay. Um, and as I say, they're, they're mostly um, business creatives and entrepreneurs. Mm. So, yeah, that's, that's basically the demographic, which is uh, different from the women in terms of, of course, the age. Um, the interesting thing was that there are six of the 20 women are not partnered. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, that kind of created a different storytelling um, that most of the men are partnered versus mm. uh, the, the women. Uh, the six of them obviously are telling a story of their own journey minus partner. Mm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. so that creates an interesting contrast. And um, perhaps we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But just mm-hmm. to give people an idea of, of how you sort of generated the stories, I know you asked them some specific questions. You were interested in invest- investigating specific aspects of their stories rather than just an open kind of book approach. So what were you looking for specifically in their experience that I know you right. drew into the, their yeah. accounts? Yes. Well, you know, the, my interview process is, is pretty organic. In other words, I don't have like a, a, a list of questions that I propose uh, during the interview. It's usually just, well, let's just start from the beginning. Where are you from? You know, tell me your name and where you're from and so on. But as the, um, as the interviews evolved, I realised that there were certain things that that I wanted to explore. And, and they were questions along lines of, you know, how do men navigate life at a time fraught with great uncertainty and rapid change and working and moving country to country on their own or with a family? And is their path easy because they're men uh, with greater liberties than, than women? Or do they encounter a different set of challenges uh, faced with the complexities of what it means to be a man today? And this, these, these questions kind of came to me, as I say, as the interviews uh, evolved. But that, that wasn't what I was looking for initially. In fact, I don't think I knew what I was looking for initially. <laughs> I just wanted to gather their stories. And because uh, uh, I was looking for twists and turns in their, in their personal um, journey, um, I just, I just wanted good story, really. And I mean, that's the thing that hit, has struck me reading them. Um, there were many twists and turns in most of the stories, and and quite incredible twists and turns. Mm-hmm. And at times, yeah. some quite desperate points in many of the stories that yeah. then seemed to initiate a change, which then brought about some new opportunities, and life went in a different direction. Did you get that sense, or was, is that just me <laughs> and my oh, interpretation? No, Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And of course, one of the biggest twists and turns in all of this was, was COVID. Um, mm-hmm. So when I started this, so it was, I really set to work on it in um, March of 2019. And I gave myself a year with this, whereas the women's book took about three years. But I wanted to really move through this uh, faster. So, of course, you know, one cannot anticipate that there's going to be some kind of, you know, <laughs> massive, unprecedented, global um, shutdown as a result of a virus. So when that happened, um, it you know, started to sort of appear in January, February, and particularly March, obviously, when we all went into, into, into quarantine, I was like, oh, God, this is really going to impact how I thought that this book would evolve and Mm. I have to include it somehow. There has to be, I have to address it. I can't not address it. This is, Mm. that would be bizarre. So I got a little um, hung up on that uh, in the spring of, of this year because I sort of, I didn't know how I was going to integrate it. I had to integrate it into the introduction. And then I realised the format for the women's book was, was again, just perfect for the men's book, which is that there is an introduction in, in my words, introducing the, the, um, the interviewee, then his story and then a oh, where is he now? Mm-hmm. And so the where, of his, where is he now, I knew I would write either during quarantine um, and then as we're coming out of quarantine and then after quarantine or post-quarantine mm-hmm. so that there would be this sort of pre, during and post-COVID story that would naturally mm-hmm. weave its way into the, into the book in this sort of postscript after each of the men's stories. Mm-hmm. And so that re- worked really well. Um, uh, but beyond that, the... Um, the organic twists and turns that the men's stories take is just, it's particular to them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I probably detected that in initial kind of conversations with the men. Perhaps they, they had some kind of um, 
uh, they alluded to it in a, perhaps in an initial conversation and then I detected that, oh, you know, there's a story here and that's mm. what I want to explore. Mm. And so just going back to the COVID, you know, the, the, the mm. summaries at the end of each chapter, mm. were there some themes you noticed in pe- in the, the postscripts, if you like, the, the COVID kind of yeah. the response people were having or taking to the, the COVID challenge? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's where the sort of the universal nature of uh, the men's stories is is apparent, is their uh, response to COVID. So there were those who were um, uh, severely impacted by by COVID economically because, Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I've said a number of times now, that they're all kind of business creatives or entrepreneurs. So when you have your own business... um, there's two ways you can be impacted and either can be positive or negatively. And because a lot of the guys are involved in travel and tourism here in, in Portugal, of course there was no tourism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for us, for instance, Ramon, whose story, he's the Uber driver, his was the first story. So it was enormously impact impactful Mm -hmm. for him because his livelihood was devastated by by COVID yeah. and um, then uh, let's see uh, James Mayer who's um, who set up a, a business in Porto taking tours uh, with uh, exclusive tours for internationals through the Douro wine region and then he'd also started to curate these walking tours through Porto that mm-hmm. were um, uh uh, he had young Portuguese, local Portuguese, taking these these food and walking tours through Porto. All of that came to a complete standstill. I mean, he kind of shut down his his booking, his online booking um, bookings because of that. And then uh, there's a um, uh, organic uh, natural food chef, um, Tolga, who is turkish portuguese no, sorry turkish german who had relocated to lisbon and he did these wonderful airbnb experiences and that's how i met him uh, food walking tours through lisbon and then he talked taught he teaches a or had taught a cooking class from his apartment in the alfama which was just glorious it was um uh, Portuguese seafood. So, of course, that all came to a complete standstill and he mm. kind of just went into hibernation. Mm. Um, another, the youngest participant in the book column, he got COVID. So he was um, uh, in isolation at home, um, mm. recovering at home with really great care from the um, uh, public health care system in Lisbon, which, you know, his story around that's fantastic. Mm. Uh, Kevin um, is a, a, a travel writer for Lonely Planet. He, at that point, he had just moved to Italy to start a living relationship with his Italian girlfriend in um, December. So he had been living here in Portugal for like six years, I think, and then this new relationship really looked like it was going to, to take off. So they moved in together. He was only there, what, six weeks before Italy went into lockdown. <laughs> So he and his girlfriend, of course, had this <laughs> yeah, trial by fire when they in lockdown. And, but he's not working because he can't travel anywhere. Mm-hmm. So then the other extreme was um, Greg, who is a marketing whiz, um, and he was already doing a lot of his work online. So some, suddenly his work was really picking up because mm. he has a couple of clients like British museums, I think, you know, American, um, uh, I don't know if there are museums, but so I won't go, I won't go there because I can't remember, but I knew there was a couple of British museums. And so he was taking a lot of their um, tours online. So he was suddenly mm-hmm. massively busy. Mm-hmm. So in other words, it's extreme from yeah. no work, no income to... Um, work really taking off. And then mm. uh, Terry Hamill, who heads up Business Networking International here, was also taking everything online, doing all their mm. weekly meetings online. His work was really picking up, not necessarily income, but his just generating um, networking online for his members was really picking up and really yeah. needed. 
he said that his members you know, really desperately needed to be connecting mm. somehow with other entrepreneurs. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I definitely reading the story has got that mix of you know those, and I, I'm sure people listening can relate to that. You know, for some people, yeah, opportunities have been generated, and for others, it's kind of a bit of a bide the time and think and look to the future. And, and well, it's difficult to tell. I think one of the stories I was reading, I can't remember whose it was, was saying. You know, we don't know what the future is going to be. So it's very difficult to make decisions about how to move forward right now. And that's very true for so many people. Yeah. Um, so just talking generally then about the themes that you pulled out from yeah. the stories, you know, not the COVID related ones, but, you know, the stories generally. Right. Um, what, what were your insights from from those? Right. The themes. Um, you know, it wasn't until I finished the uh, most of the interviews that I was aware of, I guess, how naive I was. I come from a family of girls and, and, uh, and I, you know, I obviously don't have, um, well, I'm not, not obvious, but I'm, I'm not in partnership at this point. So I'm, I, I'm not dealing daily with a, a male um, partner. I don't have children, etc. So I came to this, to this project <laughs> feeling quite naive and realising that I had a set of stereotypes that, that I believe to be somewhat true about how men are in the world. And, you know, they're, they're things like men are more adventurous, they're more autonomous or they're better resourced and really kind of um, unfortunate stereotypes, I think, that I held about men and I, and I held them to be some, somewhat true but of course none of us fits neatly into a box and, and labels are simply too limiting and this is what the men showed me and um, so some of the themes then that emerged I guess related to these stereotypes that, that I held or that I ultimately explored by sort of con contrasting the men's stories to the women's stories, and this was particularly in the in, in the introduction. And um, so I, earlier I mentioned that, for instance, six of the the women are single versus I think three of the three of the men. So there's not a mm -hmm. huge difference, but and, and of course we're only talking about a, a, a pool of say uh, forty people here, ultimately twenty men and twenty women. Um, but nevertheless, it gave me material to then dig a little deeper and do a little research. And so what I discovered is that, interestingly, men's tendency to partner um, has been linked to health and research suggests that women who stay single instead of marrying and, and those who divorce instead of staying married are healthier in the long term, whereas men who are married stay healthier. And so... You know, this this I found interesting and curious. And and then, you know, I didn't didn't sort of think that men were as connected to family and children. But in fact, the fathers amongst the men that I spoke to um, who had children uh, spoke of their children with, with such tenderness and love and affection. I was really moved by this, perhaps you know, because I don't have children. And again, I made certain assumptions about how men are with, with family and children. And several of the men carried er evident um, but contained sorrow around having been separated or estranged from children at various times uh, due to work or travel or marriages failing. And and this was... this. this uh, was was a little difficult for me to witness because though the women who had children, um, you know, might have talked about some challenging times in their life. I mean, they didn't contain or they didn't express um, uh, sorrow or, or pain or a sense of loss around um, children in any way because they were so just naturally connected to their kids. But because, of, you know, let's say just divorce, because divorce oftentimes means that the, the, the children are uh, living with the mother or spending more time with, with the mother, um, then, you know, the men are, are separated from, from their mm. kids and the, um, the, the grief that they, they carried around that was really palpable. I mean, there was mm. um, a little, I did a little uh, digging into that as well and, and, and realised that um, 
you know, the, despite men's palpable feelings around a sense of loss or separation from family or, or loved ones or children or whatever, that, you know, sadly society does not easily grant men the, the space to talk about their interior lives and, and emotions. And, and in that regard, it kind of cuts them off from their hearts. So mm. then, um, you know, accepted ideas of masculinity exclude emotional vulnerability. And, uh, and yet this is a really profound disservice to, to boys and men because, you know, vulnerability is essential to our capacity to build intimacy and sustain uh, loving and healthy relationships. And um, so in that regard, the, you know, the complexity and, and paradox of what it means to be a man today, emotionally vulnerable and heart-connected yet strong and in control, um, creates this... Um, this disparate way of being in the world that was really apparent in their stories. Um, but when the men did have a chance to, to talk about how connected they are to perhaps their loved one or their children, you know, their, their heartfelt sharing at that point was, was just... Um, uh, really uh, moving, really moving. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Actually, as, you, as you describe all of that, I, I kind of thinking about as I was reading the stories, I felt that you know, sometimes they were quite sort of um, factual, you know, I was here and then I moved to there and I did this because of that and this opportunity failed and, 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 then, and then they would start to talk perhaps about and I lost contact with my child and then you would feel the emotion coming through. But the two, yeah, it was quite different, not differentiated, um, segmented, you know, or categorised you. They didn't, how to describe it? I didn't feel that kind of joined emotion through all of, or that sense of emotion coming through through all of the stories. That was, um, I could see that separation that you're describing definitely in the stories, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think vulnerability, um, you know, and, and and courage. There is so much courage in their stories. So when when people read them, you you just that's the thing I marvel that you know some of them had hit really hard times, but continued and and found new paths and different directions, which ultimately led them to Portugal and where they are now. And I, I just found those such encouraging stories really around that whole issue of you know when things go wrong and you are at your most vulnerable you know if you look forward and look for ways to move forward and create new new stories for yourself you know new paths will look open up and 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 you will move move forward and so many of them did and created some amazing new experiences in Portugal and that and then the color of what all the different things that they're doing in Portugal I, th I think it's just for me, having lived in Portugal, I could just see those opportunities. And, and often I read it and thought, why did I not think to do those kinds of things when I lived <laughs> in Portugal? Because, you know, what fantastic things they have done, a lot of mm. them in created, and, and, and how much passion comes through for what they're doing as well. Mm. You know, that, that was something that really struck me when I was reading those stories. Um, I know in the women's book, we talked about a few, some of the women who had moved because of their partner's careers. So expat partners, I refer to them as sometimes who get referred to as trailing spouses, partners, which I don't like as a term. But a couple of the men you spoke to were or had moved to Portugal because of their partner's um, work. What did you notice? Did you notice differences in the way they talked about their experience to the way women talked about theirs in, in the women's book? Or was it very similar because they were doing and playing similar roles and that they were supporting yeah. their partner? Yeah. Yeah. I, those two guys were fascinating. And I think ultimately when I, I did hear about their stories, I thought, oh, they're definitely two I want to interview because I didn't really want to contrast their experience to the women's experience of being a, and I learned this term from you, I think, an accompanying partner. Yes, much better. Not even trailing. <laughs> These days it's going to be so neutral. So yes, accompanying partner. <laughs> partner. And I really wanted to talk to them um, to find out about what their journey was, was, was like. And um, so Eric is Danish, so he's Nordic. So he, he comes from a culture where 
there's there's far more of a level level playing field and there's a lot more support for men taking on the role of both primary carer mm. for children and playing a more equal role in the home. So for him, um, I think at one point I, I did ask him a question, something along the lines of, what what do you parents think, <laughs> think about you doing this? Because you know, you know, so often our parents or another generation get a little judgy mm. about the way we live our life. And he kind of looked at me like, like this was not an issue and and in fact that's what he said he said well my parents accept it this is a perfectly natural role for, for me in in denmark but when he talked about the challenges that he encountered um taking on this role initially when they first moved to the us when their two, two girls were just little um i felt like i was hearing the story that so many women tell, which is this loss of identity. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of humorous. He'd say, well, you know, I really didn't have much to bring to the table at the end of the day. I mean, I'd say that, well, I took the girls, I dropped them off at school, I did the groceries, I played a little golf, I um, picked the girls up, we had a play date, got home, that was my day. And he said, you know, we'd go to events, um, um, events that were connected with my wife's work and, you know, people were really interested to talk to her and hear about what she was doing and she was happy. And then people would ask me, well, what are you doing? And I'd tell them and I'd see them kind of draw this blank mm -hmm. and they'd maybe turn away and look for someone else to talk to. And I really felt the pain of that for him. And I also mm -hmm. thought, yeah, that's what women deal with a lot. <laughs> women, women with little kids, <laughs> that's what they're dealing with. But for him as a, as a, you know, a Nordic man, this was nevertheless still really painful. And he, mm -hmm. not that I reflected to him that this was sort of an existential crisis, but it was because mm -hmm. what he said was I began to wonder, well, who am I? What's, what's yeah. my role? What are what am I supposed to be doing if, if you know, nobody's interested in, in me or my story? Well, who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? Anyway, so he managed to, he managed to really, I think, grow through all of this and become really aware of what was important to him so that when they went back to Denmark after that stint in the US, he went back to his teaching role and the, more of a level playing field again uh, in their work lives. But then Anne, his wife, was then doing a lot more work in London at that time, but it wasn't working for him because the girls were then um, uh, a little bit older, but they were really needing their mother. And then he was really upset because well, he was like, well, come on, you know, I'm playing mum and dad and the girls still want their mother. They don't want me, they want their mother. You know, I'm doing everything. I'm juggling all these. And again, I was thinking, yeah, I hear that from, from mothers a lot about juggling all the balls and, and still the, the kids get upset with them. Mm. And then when they came here to Portugal, the girls are a little bit older and he realised this time I need to be doing something for me. I can't relocate with my wife's work and just mm -hmm. be the, 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 the primary carer and the stay-at-home dad. I need to be doing something. So he went back to doing something he'd done as a teenager, which is tennis coaching. And uh, he um, initially kind of judged himself, I think, for that, but nevertheless realised, no, it was important to, for him to be doing something that was just for him and again this is something I hear women talking about whether they're relocating spouses or whether they're mums at home with children they often talk about the importance of finding something just for them mm -hmm. and and that's what Eric did and he and he's still doing it and I think he's also doing some private coaching because they the house that they, they ultimately bought a house. I think it has a tennis court. Oh, and he, <laughs> during, yeah, during quarantine, he actually offered it to the, one of the tennis clubs that, that he had been working with prior to, to quarantine to do private lessons for, for mm -hmm. people who were sort of stuck at home so they could social distance. Mm 
Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and then it worked for him, it worked for his clients. It was just win-win all around. Mm -hmm. So he's really figured out how to um, find or carve out a life for himself as yeah. an accompanying yeah. spouse. And he talks very intimately about their marriage and and i'm not going to give away details because that's where his story is fascinating mm -hmm. but he does talk very intimately about how they work the marriage and mm -hmm. um and how he has found a life for himself uh in a very unconventional um situation just one thing yeah. i'll say though is that i asked him about the girls i said do you know did the girls realize what an unusual dad you are and he said, well, no, because I'm their dad. <laughs> I just think that this is normal. So I thought that was really sweet. That's really a very nice, nice role model that they have, actually, and, uh, you know, quite a different one from perhaps many people. But, um, and I think that what strikes me is, as you tell that story, and I think whether you're male or female as a partner, it, it is that point about really thinking about what's in it for you. And whilst that can feel a little bit selfish, I think it is so important, you know, when, when you're thinking about moving and relocating to a new country because of your, your partner's work, that you take the time to think about what that element for you is going to be, you know, and it might be professional, but it it's, might be personal, it might be a hobby, it might be volunteering, it might be um, something completely different from what you've been doing in your home location. But just so important to think about that and I, I think that often people don't think about that because they're so focused on that move that initial move and settling in and and that's the aim that's the goal and it seems like such a big one oh we're moving to a new country and we're going to settle in this new country and build our lives there um they don't break it down to but actually what is it going to mean for me personally but it's really important that you do that and it might not be that you know exactly before you leave but just being open and allowing yourself to have those thoughts is, is mm -hmm. important and recognizing that at some point probably in the, in the next five six months this thought will occur to me I can mm -hmm. guarantee to everyone listening it will occur mm -hmm. to you you will suddenly say well what about me mm -hmm. and um and and to to have already given it a bit of thought and have an open communication and conversation about it with your partner so that they're aware that you're going to be needing to find something for you as well because yeah as as you said you know, this featured in your other book about the women but also in so many conversations i've had over the years with partners who've moved yeah. to their, their partner's career so yeah. yeah really important point to underline there so yeah, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether you're male or female it, it that That's issue right. arise mm. And I'm not saying everyone has to have a career either. I just want to underline that. That's not what I'm saying. It's just no, about right. yeah, having a focus for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interestingly, there's not a lot of gender difference there, in other words, yeah. in the way that the women talk about their life as an accompanying spouse and the men talking about their life as an accompanying spouse. It's, and I think you've, you uh, hit on a really important point there, which is the communication in the um, uh, relationship, the, the marriage or between the, the, the two people involved is of primary importance that mm. they can mm. talk about um, the roles and functions that they're go both going to, to, to play in the relationship while they're, you know, living out of their country of origin, if you like. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really important. That's uh, an interview I did with... Um, Jennifer Particulieri, who is, um, no, she's British actually, married to, I think, an Italian. And she wrote a book called Couples That Work. Um, and it's all about um, making your way through the different transitions in life, but as a couple um, and recognizing. And she talks about three major transition points, but I think expat decisions kind of bring forward some of those decision points um but the importance of working towards or through those transitions together and that those are the real challenging points for your relationship and this is certainly you know if you're moving abroad that is one challenging point for a relationship and that the way in which you set it for success is by you know the way in which you you talk about that transition and how you're going to work together to make it work and that you know perhaps for one for some time one partner's career leads and perhaps another 
leads another time or mm-hmm. yeah you you work it out yourselves and it's not mm-hmm. that there's an easy solution because there never is but that mm-hmm. that open communication is so so important and understanding each other's perspectives on it is so important and I think one of the other issues that has come off up so many times for me over the years watching others and at times for me personally as well is that whole thing of, as a partner of financial dependency mm-hmm. but then for the working employee being the one who is financially responsible when perhaps you know in your home life you've both had careers you've both contributed financially that changes and that then changes the dynamics of the relationship as well and so having that open conversation about that before you go is really important too and if you have gone and you haven't had the open conversation about it I suggest you know you do because um there can be all kinds of hidden dynamics there (laughs) that you don't realize are going on um but sharing and discussing that and working out how you manage that is so important yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah um so any other themes that came through that you want to share about Mm, oh yeah the men's stories do tend to be more work focused Mm. and of course i i do think that's sort of a little bit of a uh, a gender bias that men do tend to to talk about their work. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not to say that the women didn't talk about the work, their work, but the women's mm-hmm. stories did tend to be more holistic. Yeah. Whereas mm-hmm. the men's stories did tend to be more about getting ahead, and the mm-hmm. getting ahead, and this is what uh, I, again maybe it's because I'm kind of naive, but the getting ahead was about trying to move their life forward in a way or in such a way that they would be able to care for family, care for Mm -hmm. partner and care for family. And on the one hand, I I found that um, admirable. And on the other hand, I found that um, uh, hugely, what a responsibility, you know, what Mm a... That, that their life goal is about other, it's about caring for other and the other mm-hmm. is their immediate um, family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, to me, the men had less freedom mm-hmm. than the women because of either the pressures that uh, they feel culture imposes upon them or then that they impose upon themselves or impose on each other. Yeah. So when I think about the, the six women who were single in the, in the women's book, perhaps they had been married or partner at some point, but at the point at which I interviewed them, they were single. Uh, and let's see, well, were they all older? No, they weren't all older. They were sort of from 40 to 65. Mm-hmm. The level of freedom they had compared to the men was enormous. Mm. And was that because they didn't have children, or they had children who'd grown and they um, perhaps, uh, were independent? All, independent yeah, and, mm, all of that time all of life. Of, yeah. Yes. Mm. Mm. And you know, I was just listening to an, uh, a couple of older interviews with Gloria Steinem um, just recently, and she was talking about moving into your 50s or women moving into their 50s and then into their 60s and that these are sort of, uh, you know, the press of these and she called them new, it's like moving into a new country, your 50s and then your 60s is a totally new country because you're completely free. You know, if you've had children, they have definitely launched. You might even be a grandparent at that point. Mm. But that you have this enormous freedom from all these sort of, you know, gender, um, uh, uh, biases that, that 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 we live with as women to just live your life without those to live your life mm. with a with a set of freedoms that you just can't imagine as a younger woman and then so I wonder about men are they ever really free from from those I don't know I don't know that they are yeah whether they get to that point where they can let those responsibilities go it's really interesting because I think yes I can definitely see just from my personal life and and conversations I would have with my husband about how we manage our lives, very practical orientation from him about, you know, that's what life is about. It's about getting through stage by stage. And 
and and providing. You've made me feel rather guilty, actually. <laughs> I've just suddenly had a bit of an epiphany there about some of the conversations we've had. But no, um, a valuable point, really important point. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, that we, how society and these, you know, our beliefs around gender and and roles, and some of them are subconscious, and we're not even aware that we are playing those roles or perpetuating mm. that. But the way in which mm. we talk about um, these roles and, mm. and and then live our lives just perpetuates that. And I can totally see from the stories, and I think that's what I was trying to explain earlier, not perhaps as well as you, you're talking about the holistic way in which the women talked about their stories, whereas the men being quite practical orientated and sort of but you know explaining this stage and this stage what happened here and then I moved and it was always looking forward to creating the next thing um with quite clarity about the fact that that had to be created um perhaps that's the entrepreneur entrepreneurial mindset of a lot of them though because that's what they were you know with their own businesses and so on they had that kind of mindset Mm -hmm. um that was interesting but Mm -hmm. yeah fascinating reading I think probably Mm -hmm. um it really I would really recommend people to buy both books and read and contrast and then reflect on you know the different stories and the yes yes they've got both of them yeah. there um so obviously I will put on the blog um page um links to those both book both those books um and you can go to Amazon or any good bookseller and find them there um, and I'm sure if you'd like to get in touch with Louise to talk about those books or you would like Louise to come and talk to a group that you are a member of online currently. I mean, yeah, yes, I know yes. you'll be very happy, wouldn't you, to do some online um, conversations around the book. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I will put links to Louise. Um, well, Louise, you, you tell people how they can get in touch with you. Well, I think um, the easiest way is to probably go to my website, louiseross.com, and then uh, at the bottom of the page you can see my email address and then the both books appear on the home page and you can click through to Amazon um, if, you, if you'd like to purchase the books. But that's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me, through my yeah. website. Okay, okay. Well, I will put links there and, and, and anyone listening who wants to get in touch with Louise can at louiseross.com. So that's easy, R-O-S-S.com. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today, Louise. I've really enjoyed oh, the conversation. Oh, pleasure. Thank you, Louise. Thank Always you. great to talk with you. Yeah, and, and you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. And thank you so much for listening. Remember, to access links and the full transcript from this conversation, go to thrivingabroad.com episode 68. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to the regular podcast newsletter so I can keep you up to date with all the latest podcast news. Thank you once again to Louise for joining me today. Remember, go to www.louiserossross.com to learn more about Louise and her work. I'll be back next week with the next episode in the Thriving Abroad podcast series. Meanwhile, take care, stay well, wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye for now.